Well, hello, Kim. Hi, Mike. For those who haven't come across you online, introduce yourself to the listeners and tell them why we're talking today. My name is Kim Newlove. I'm a pharmacist, voice actor, podcast host, wife, and mother. And we are talking today because I have a business called The Pharmacist Voice. Kim, you reached out probably a year ago when I kind of started up the podcast. You were really taking your time getting going. Because I would say, hey, Kim, do you want to do this? And you're like, no, not yet. Should we do this? And you're like, no, not yet. I know we wanted to get to this point, meeting each other, getting you on here and so on. Then I go to your LinkedIn and I'm seeing all the stuff you did to prepare for this, this being your voiceover business. A lot of work you did leading up to this. When I first started in the voiceover industry, I didn't know I was in the voiceover industry, to be honest. I had this idea that I wanted to narrate pharmacy continuing education journals into some sort of a audio format. And in order to do that, I needed some training, according to the audio engineer that I met. To get the training, I had to go to different instructors. And early on, I met an instructor who told me that as long as you're in the business, I don't know if it was her that told me this, to be honest, but many people in the business have told me, as long as you're in the business, you should plan on training once a month with somebody to improve your performance for as long as you're in the industry or until you die. <laughs> Keep improving. Yes, keep improving, sharpening your skills, learning how to do new things. It'll help you go places. And one of the types of training that I've had is improv training, which I never saw myself doing. I'm a kind of straight-laced person, a kind of a serious, formal person. But improv has helped me play the villain instead of the nice stay-at-home mom. It's been really eye-opening. It helps me go places. I had a guest on for improv, and I know it's the yes and, and it keeps the story going and that kind of stuff. How does that help with your voiceover? Because I'm imagining the voiceover is quite prepared. You're doing a script, and you're doing it sometimes within 30 seconds. Well, that's obviously prepared. And the stuff that you're doing with the continuing education, that seems to be prepared. At least it had to be prepared for me because I know I couldn't talk about anything that's in continuing education without something in front of me. But so how does the improv help you with this new career of yours? I've only had level one training. Out of all the three levels, I've had level one. What it's helped me with is going places that I need to when I'm being directed Say I've I've been in a session before where the director wants more smile in my voice. And I think of all the things that I've ever said in improv class, which is usually hilarious and not exactly G-rated. <laughs> 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 to, to get me, who's kind of a straight-laced person, to, to go outside my shell, it, it takes me... Uh, a little effort, let's just say. You normally are not dropping... F bombs and things like that. But Correct. in improv, in improv has pulled you. Not, I'm just kind of joking with that, but that's <laughs> pulled you to do some of this stuff that's not so G rated. Right. Or to allow myself to smile and laugh and let my guard down and to end up having things come out of my mouth that sound like I'm smiling. Ah. It helps me go somewhere with my voice, my delivery. I always told my staff years ago, I'd say, smile when you answer the phone because people can tell. It's true. When did you get that idea that you wanted to use your voice? I can probably tell you the exact moment, not the date on the calendar, but I was in, uh, it was bedtime routine. I was in my older son's bedroom reading to him. And I thought of the joy that it brought me to read to him. We got to the point where we were reading young adult books, like Percy Jackson, for example. Yeah, sure. And I have a 17-year-old son with autism, and about four years ago when he was 13, we're reading these books, and I thought, I enjoy this so much, and I've got the best audience ever, right? My son's right here. Right. He loves it. Right. And I thought that it could take me someplace as a pharmacist where I could narrate something that maybe somebody who needed it narrated could enjoy it. I wanted to find out if there was a gap I could fill. 
does anybody need me to read this pharmacy continuing education stuff? And as I went along, years later, pitching companies, the world hasn't been ready for that. There's been so many no's. You know, I've actually interviewed with a company recently who seems like they want to say, yeah, I'm ready for that. Let's do it. And that's when I really realized that I wanted to do this narration business. I was laying in bed, you know, reading with my son and thinking, just dreaming, like, how can I get paid for this? Because I love it so much. So you thought about that. And then you started, before you probably had everything set up, are you saying that you started putting the bug in people's ears right away, pretty much, and nobody really seemed interested? And what year was that? I started putting the bug in people's ears Oh boy, I would say 2017. How long was that after you were lying with your son and and you thought of this? I would say less than 12 months. Okay. I thought about it. You know, I thought, how can I do this? And one day I just got up the nerve to call a local studio and meet with an engineer and just ask him questions. You record people every day. I've seen your website. They produce commercials and whatnot. How do I do that? But with this idea that I want to move forward with. And that's when he told me, you need training. And then it, that wasn't even the moment I found out about the voiceover industry. He just basically said, you need training and to be able to deliver that and to be able to record, edit and produce audio. He clued me in on a lot of the stuff I didn't know. And that's really when I got started. 2017. Yes, I would say October 2017. So exactly three years ago. Pretty much, yes. I could probably show you the notes. I keep uh, detailed notebooks of my day-to-day to-do lists. But I knew before that, I had actually formed my LLC right around that time, but I was in talks with an attorney that summer. I I told myself, as soon as the kids go back to school in August, I'm going to meet with an attorney, I'm going to form my LLC, Between the time where I was reading in bed with my son and the time I talked to an attorney, I had the company name. This was before I went into the voiceover industry at all. I knew I wanted to do something with my identity as a pharmacist, and I knew I wanted to do something with my voice, either literally or figuratively, you know, like in writing. Kim, I ain't no genius, but but it seems to me that going to even the attorney and setting something up, you either had a little proof of concept somehow that that this was needed, or did you sort of build it and it will come kind of thing where you said, if I get this going, I know I'm hearing people on the radio and on the internet, and if I get this background and this infrastructure going, something's going to happen. Was that kind of how it went? It was definitely the latter, the faith part. I build it on faith for sure. Yep. I I saw what I thought was a gap that needed to be filled. There was no proof of concept. I didn't even I didn't even know there was a I didn't even know there was podcasts out at the point. I found that I as a consumer, as a pharmacist who has to complete pharmacy continuing education, personally would like to have it in audio format because I'm a busy mom. You know, I've got things to do. At the time, I think I had two dogs. You have to walk the dogs. You have to do the beds, the dishes, the laundry, the dinner prep. You got to cook, serve, clean up. So much stuff. And I wanted, as a consumer, I wanted content in audio format. And that is what I thought the gap was. There was written content. There was no audio content. Hence a gap. There was live CE, Mm -hmm. which where you were getting this kind of crappy audio sounded like it was in an echo chamber (laughs) for the CE. And that probably had to be, well, parts of that had to be live, right? It had to have at least the the live question, answer, and so on at the end. But the gap that you could not find was CE that probably counted as not live CE, but it was audible. Let's use an example. There was one company in particular that had short conversational CE, and I wanted to turn that into audio format because I thought that would be the very best candidate to get this ball rolling. What do you mean short conversational? It was written as short conversational? 
I'm going to drop a name here, the pharmacist letter. Their information was short and to the point and that kind of stuff. You're talking about their letter itself. It was short conversational, not back and forth conversational, but conversational prose, I guess they call it. Written in a conversational way, short and punchy. You wanted to see that in or hear that in audio and nobody was doing that. Not that I could find. My research could never have been exhaustive. I could never have looked at every sure. piece of CE. And I didn't even really get into the live webinar thing at the time. I mean, I still don't get into the live webinar thing. Yeah, the whole webinar thing. I mean, that's come a long way with COVID, but that's still a little bit odd because it's it's live and a lot of times it's free and it's live. But then if you don't catch the live part, then after a few days, they charge you or you have to sign up for something like that. So it's not terribly clean. I think it encompasses a lot of different formats and stuff. That's just my guess. And you think there was some of that going on for CEs? I didn't think there was any going on where it was professionally recorded, edited, and produced, where somebody was behind a mic and there was no distracting audio. It doesn't sound like somebody's in a bathtub because they've got their laptop open and they're speaking directly into it, that sort of thing. But you think some of the webinars were doing that or you never checked into that? I didn't check into the live webinars. People told me all the time they would turn on a webinar and just drive their commute and listen to it and consume it like a podcast or like audio CE. And I thought, well, yeah, that's what I want to do. But I want to work with companies to produce some sort of audio where it's short and punchy and lis listenable. You yeah. Because if you read a textbook, how listenable is that, Mike? Yeah. If you read a journal article, how listenable is it? Right. I One of the mistakes I made when I first started looking into converting CE into audio format was I realized that it was not meant for the ear. It was meant for the eye. And in fact, I think it was podcast number four for the Pharmacist Voice podcast. I mentioned mistakes I've made, and that was one of them. I assumed that you could just read them. You can't. They're not written for the ear. They're written for the eye. And that's a huge point. Because they talk about like figures and stuff or what? There's that. But my biggest point is they're really long, complicated sentences, something that needs to be broken up into four shorter ones. I can't even read those. <laughs> they could take something longer and you might be able to read it because you can kind of keep your place and things like that. But in, in spoken language, those should be like four different sentences. Either that or change the sentence so that you get directly to the point. They would fluff it up a little bit with those longer sentences, or why would they be longer, do you think, if they could have gotten to the point? Because it wasn't written by a copywriter. Oh, yeah, right. Gotcha. It was the intended audience is someone who's sitting down reading it with their eyes. Somebody who wants to read all the parenthetical references. You know, this was published from Journal of the American Pharmaceutical Association in this year, this issue, and so on. You know, it's it's meant to be published in some sort of a journal. It wasn't meant for uh, spoken audio. Especially with the goal of short and punchy. I think there was a Harry Potter book once, and it was different from all the rest. And I can't remember which one it was. All the Harry Potter books were meant to be read with the eye, but they turned them into audio books, of course. But then there was one that was meant to be read as a play. That's kind of like that movie on Golden Pond. You ever seen that one with Jane Fonda? And um, it's an old, you had to be an old fart to watch it. Heard of it, never seen it. But you could tell it was a play. You could tell it came from a play because all of the conversation was, you know, short back and forth kind of stuff like that. It's just different, you know, and I'm not condemning the way that journals are written at all. I would love to work with companies to turn content into audio. But if it's not written for the ear, it's just plain old not written for the ear. That's really interesting. That damn Harry Potter. Have you read that? I've read the Harry Potter series multiple times. Yes. <laughs> I've read the first page of the first Harry Potter probably about eight times. Something about a black <laughs> cat in a driveway or something like that. And I've never <laughs> – is that – does that ring a bell? It's, I've never gotten past that first page. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I, I've read that first page a couple of times too, but I did make it a little further than you. <laughs> yeah. I've never, I've never made it further than that. 
Some people just are not Harry Potter people. I would like to be, but my, you know, my kids and my wife and everybody have read it, but I can never get past the black cat thing. So you're thinking someone's got to have something a little bit more exciting than this. And the stuff you're coming across is, well, first of all, it's probably not great technology yeah, as a rule. It's probably not great technology. It's probably read by someone who's not used to reading. And it's probably rather dry because it's visual instead of being meant to be verbal from the start. So you're looking around for this stuff. You call some companies up. You don't have much luck. You know you have a lot to learn. Where does it go from there then? There's a step that you may not know about where I make a demo. I take their content and I narrate two minutes of it and I send it to them so they know what it's going to sound like. And what I do is I'll, I'll take something of theirs and I'll take it directly from the website and I'll read it. Maybe that's why I don't hear back from them. I don't know. I think that's fantastic. If I took it and I copy wrote it, you know, if I wrote it, the way that it needs to sound, if it is in some sort of a e-learning course, they might say, oh my gosh, this is what we've been missing out on. I don't know. You're reading what they have put out there, but your skill is also in making it pithy. L- listenable is really what it's all about. Listenable is better than even short. Something that's listenable. It has to be something that the intended user is going to enjoy listening to. It's really all about the listener. And I'm not saying that people are putting out content that is bad. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that what I'm looking at, I would change. And I would like to work with companies to help them change it. I don't really want to do the writing part, but I do want to connect them with the idea that there's a different way to do it. And there's people out there that are instructional designers that do this for a living. You know enough to say that this could be a little bit more exciting to read, but you would even reach out for that help yourself to get that done. I just want to be behind the mic because my time is limited. If you know what I mean, I would love to, you know, work with people. If I wish I had the time to work with people to write content, and there's there's part of me that's a little self conscious about bringing it to the attention of others that what they've got is not listenable because I'm telling somebody essentially that what you've got is a great uh, a great product, great to read. But if you're going to change it into audio, it it may not be as listenable. It's a hard conversation to have without, and I guess maybe I'm just sensitive. I don't want to accuse somebody of what they've written. This beautiful thing written by a PhD is not good enough, (laughs) you know? They probably get off the phone and they say, boy, that Kim was long-winded. Why didn't she just say it was boring? That's what she meant. (laughs) (laughs) It's not even a boring thing. I I don't know how to describe it. I understand. I'm just teasing you. It's just different. (laughs) It's just different. I'm sensitive, Mike. Stop it. (laughs) You know what author I read a little bit of? I don't read very much, but um, I don't read very much fiction. But it kind of reminds me of like James Patterson. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yes, I've read many of his, the Alex Cross novels. Mm -hmm. James Patterson, for for the listeners that don't know, is uh, a very popular, what would you call it, suspense? Not, Not mystery so much, but suspense author. And he started as an advertising executive. And one of his clients, who I guess is not even in business anymore, so maybe I shouldn't be saying he did a good job, but it was uh, Toys R Us. And so he invented things like where a kid should be a kid or something. Or wait, maybe that's that might be um, Chuck E. Cheese. I don't know. But the Toys R Us thing. But he came from an advertising world. So he basically did similar things that you're talking about, not all the way to voice, but he doesn't have any chapters that are really more than two pages, you know, to speak of. And so he wanted a page turner. So he basically took all of that fluff out and he just really moves the story along. But that came from his copywriting over the years, just really every sentence 
you know, mean something. Now, it's not good for the person that likes to sit there and maybe read um, T.S. Eliot. Uh, was he the one with the Lord of the Rings and all that stuff? I think that's, I think that is. That's J.R.R. Tolkien, right? God, you, or something. You put two initials in the front name and it messes me up. I have no idea yeah, what the hell I'm I, doing. I hope I'm not messing that up too. No, Jeez. that's right. Tolkien. Tolkien was Lord of the Rings, I believe. Yeah, that's a different story. I mean, that you read those because you like to read. You you like those words going through your eyes and you like the feeling of that because I heard those are kind of long, you know, long books like that. Well, it takes all kinds. Here's the thing. I just went through this really long nonfiction audiobook narration course with a instructor. Sean Pratt, he did a fantastic job teaching me. And he said, no matter what you're reading, it's your job as the narrator to make it sound interesting and to be excited about it. And if somebody wanted me to read journal articles, I would. And I would try to do my very best to make it sound exciting and engaging and interesting. But I'm in pursuit of something a little bit different. I like e-learning at this point. Medical narration tends to be a little shorter, mm -hmm. but e-learning, I like the idea that I get to connect somebody with the material and I get to pretend that I'm a teacher at a school, you know, in the classroom, teaching people who are really interested in this. And I need to make it sound like I'm geeking out about it. No matter how it's written and whatever it is, I trust that I trust in my performance training, right. which I'm continuing to improve all the time to bring out the best performance possible because making a connection with the listener with the audience is important it's everything now you said e-learning is that are you saying there that it's okay for this stuff to be a little bit heady right now because that interests you rather than just reading advertising copy or something i'm not really in this for advertising so it's okay for it to be a little bit a little bit thick right Yes, I kind of expect thick. Yeah. I think people come to me with thick because they know that I'm able to handle thick. <laughs> right. Yes. What quickly comes to mind for me is your ability to pronunciate the drugs and make it sound natural. What are other skills that you've learned of reading thick? You know, what else is in there? Let's say you have a great advertising reader who's never done medical before or never has done pharmacy before, where are they going to stumble, do you think, that some of your skills you've worked on? This is a really interesting question, and I want to break it down into two parts. And Please it, do. <laughs> I'll, I'll admit, okay, somebody who hasn't done medical narration, not only do they need to learn how to pronounce the words, they also need to learn how to deliver them. When I first started... I had a huge chip on my shoulder, and I tell everybody this. I thought, oh, I'm a pharmacist. Give me whatever. I can pronounce whatever. I can do it better than anybody starting out. And I'm not really one of those proud uh, people like that, but I really thought that I, I had this. When I went into my first group medical narration class, I realized that my pronunciations were fine. My delivery sucked bad. It was kind of like a boring read. Like it sounded like I was reading. Hmm. And then you wanted to know how, where would somebody start? Well, they have to f figure out how to pronounce the words. I don't care if they get out a medical dictionary and challenge themselves to learn all the words in a piece of copy that has been given to them or if there are the top 200 drugs on so many different websites, you want to start there, learn how to pronounce them. That's on them. But to deliver it, one of the skills that I've learned in medical narration training and nonfiction audiobooks training is to do what's called suck the juice out of the fruit. Hmm. There will be a word. We already talked about sounding like you smile when you're saying something. I was talking the other day on my podcast about how much I love Ticket to Ride Switzerland. And you can just hear me smiling when I say Switzerland. Because I love that map. You know, my mom's distant relatives are from Switzerland. There's some love of Switzerland when you hear me say Switzerland. And 
when you're saying something and you're trying to communicate an idea and you want somebody to feel a certain way about it, your voice changes and maybe you slow down when you're getting to the end of something. And I'm not saying I deliver everything perfectly. I still have plenty to learn, but I've got some skills in my pocket because I've had training. I am training with a new instructor. Uh, I just started with Debbie Irwin and she's fantastic. And I love how hard the material she's been giving me is. Really? She gave me, yes, yes. She'll give me scripts for trying to think if it was the important safety information, ISI for a drug that I had actually never seen. And it was talking about all of the different microorganisms that this drug killed. And I'm like, oh, cool. I've never heard of this. (laughs) And there was different microorganisms I had never heard of. And I knew the second word, but not the first. And, you know, I did a little basic research and then I had it. And she told me I nailed all of them. And I was like, yeah, that's right. (laughs) But the delivery still needed just a little bit of of, uh, polishing, let's just say. But it's kind of awesome to start with that foundation where I can pronounce things that I had never heard of, but yet I can research it and quickly catch up. It really cuts the learning curve. I like to play piano and I only do sight reading. So in other words, I won't play things that I've seen before. And I'm I'm on a website called Scribed, I think it's called, S-C-R-I-B-D. And it's got books and things like that for nine bucks a month or something. But the main thing it has is, for me, is piano music. So I can always read something that I've never read before. And I've been doing this years and years and years. And it's fun as I keep getting better because... If there's like one low note that I don't know exactly where it is or one chord or something, it sure is pleasurable to move right along. And then when you get there, you spend a little bit more thought or time hitting it, but it doesn't drain you for the rest of the song. Then you keep going. And I imagine that's close to what you're talking about, where you've got that bass down so well that if you have to learn one word or something, that's fine. But your head's not spinning because you've had to think through the whole thing. It's kind of uh, getting to be more of a more of a habit almost, wouldn't you say? Yes. It's almost like you've got more patience because so so much of it is easy. You know, if you've got half of it in the bag. Then you've sent out these recordings to these companies and the response wasn't great? I often don't get a response. And what I do is I'll send something out. First, I'll make connections with people. You will first. Yes, usually on LinkedIn. I don't usually cold call, you know, cold email. There's usually some sort of engagement prior to that. And in fact, I'll try to mention a mutual acquaintance prior to sending them something. I'll say, hey, hey, I'm a pharmacist, voice actor, and podcast host, and I would like to propose that we work together, and I'm going to send you this. What I try to do is find somebody that I know, a warm handoff, so to speak here, between an organization and the person in charge of learning design. Learning design. That's what they call it? You know what? There's all kinds of creative (laughs) names for it. I could get out my marketing binder and tell you all the interesting (laughs) titles these people have. There's a million different (laughs) titles. I'm not sure why they do that. Instructional designer, learning designer. (sighs) They have some creative titles, let's just say. And it's it's kind of fun to see how they themselves identify themselves on LinkedIn. Why do they do that? Why do they change the, the designation so much? I work with some really creative people, and I think they're just expressing their creativity. Oh, they're creative. And so they want to they wanna say, well, I can't really be creative in my name if it's, you know, Joe Smith. I'm not going to change that. I maybe could be like that Tolkien dude and just put a few initials in front <laughs> yeah. of it. And and they can't be creative about their company for which they work. The only thing where they can be creative is by putting it in their job description. <laughs> Is that it? I think they're creative in their job, too. Yeah, but nobody can see that offhand. They want to put it (laughs) right in their name so it's clever. (laughs) Those are the people that I pitch, though. I get their email, (laughs) and I send them a two-minute sample, and I'll send them the piece of copy that I read so they can follow along and see how it matches up. 
and I often don't hear back. And I wonder sometimes if maybe I should take this to my accountability group or some of the other groups that I'm part of and just ask, if it were you, what would you do? Because that's what accountability groups are great for. You can ask and then they make you accountable for following up. (laughs) Yeah, they need to come back and do it. But often what you have to accept is silence. You have to accept that sometimes they just don't get back to you and you can keep trying. But in some of the performance training that I've uh, taken on, the business of the business is included too. And that is something that I've talked to instructors about. And they say, (coughs) Oh, (laughs) jeez. Lady. My new lab. Oh, yay. Lady. I love dogs. Sorry about that. Oh, that's fine. We thought we had our last dog. It was like a... 10 year old little dog we thought she'd live till she was you know 15 or something but she passed away so we got this one so we're back in the dog business <laughs> um your teacher was telling you something my teacher was saying that it's going to come to the point where you have to just let go sometimes you can only follow up so much i can probably revisit some of these things as my business progresses and i learn more ways to work with people And maybe I'm not approaching them in the way that they need to be approached. Maybe they're not ready to hear what I have to say. I'm not sure. I will never know. It would be so helpful to me to understand why they decline or why they don't even get back to me. But I just don't have that information. It's interesting, though, because you look at advertising and now people are maybe a little spoiled more than they were years ago when you had just broadcasting. Now you've got more zoomed in, you know, marketing, but you'd have people, it would happen often where you'd say, you'd say to a customer, and it's harder in a pharmacy because with hundreds and thousands of customers, you can't really sit down and give them an interview of where'd you hear about us from and so on. When you ask people, how did you hear about us? Or why are you here? You know, I saw you at the health fair, or I saw you on, you know, when I was watching the news, I saw you on this show and commercial, and you haven't been on there. People create the stories in their head. They don't know where they've seen you, but there was something that got, I suppose, to the tipping point of them then finally trusting you. So a lot of times you're just not going to know. And you don't hear back from people either. And I don't take it personally. It's time to move on to the next project then. Here's what I do. What's that? Like when I'm interviewing people for a job at the pharmacy, I don't even recognize them until I've heard from them three times. Because I want the employee who's going to press a customer, who's going to say, you know, I never got a hold of Mrs. Jones, and I want to make sure that she understands that her medicine's not coming in till two days from now instead of tomorrow. So I'm going to call her now at 2 o'clock. I'm going to call her at 5 o'clock. And before I leave, I'm going to tell Sally, the other technician, to make sure to try to call her in the morning because I want to make sure that blah, blah, blah. So now... I don't know if the people that are hiring you need to see your tenacity, but I need (laughs) to see the tenacity of a future employee. So let's say that I get X applications in from a job post I put on, let's say, a college board or something like that. The application comes in, that's one. They don't hear from me. An email comes in from them. Well, depending on how hard up I am, but an email comes in from them, you know, and I may not do anything. It's finally when that third, that text comes in or they stop by the store or they do a follow up a week later and say, hey, I wasn't sure if you were this or this or that, if you've seen this and so on. Now, at that point, maybe I've missed a lot of other good people. If I had plenty of time, maybe I'd call them and do something more, uh, more polite or something, but I know that third person that's coming, that third time they're coming after me, they really want it. So I'm not saying you do things three times because like I say, they may not care at all if you've got the the stick-to-itiveness and the tenacity when you're going to be their voice. But I always tell people, I say, don't stop at least until the third time. I do it at least three times. What I'm talking about is my direct marketing. That's not the only way I get work. You know, I'm on rosters for things I am on what's called pay-to-play sites. It's online casting. I do not have an agent at this time, but I get word-of-mouth references. Uh, I mean, there's more than one way. People hear my podcast and they, you know, that's another thing. I didn't realize how much my podcast would really get my name out there and give people samples of what my voice sounds like. 
and they get to know, like, and trust me there from the podcast, that I wanted it to be a business tool where I positioned myself in people's minds as a pharmacist who does voiceover work. That was that was my end game. But the extent to which they get to know, like, and trust me has been really interesting. I've had people from the other side of the planet in Australia come to me by email and say, I want to work with you, but I don't know how this is going to work. And they kind of lay it, just this one client laid it on me. You know, you come up with an idea and let's work together. I didn't have enough information. I asked for more information. We didn't end up working together. And I think they found somebody to do the thing that they needed to do. But I thought that was interesting. I had no idea work would come to me really that way. That was really cool. Now, wait a minute. No like and trust. I thought that people were supposed to just pick one of those. <laughs> Usually, the more they know me through the podcast, the less they like me and trust oh, me. Oh, come on now. <laughs> it's all three of those? I didn't know that. I think the podcasting is a great way to go. Yes. I think it's great. I mean, especially because of, I mean, it's right down your alley. I mean, you know, you know, with voice and so on. It's voice. Yeah. There's a few great things I love about podcasting. One is the theory of it that more people have time to listen than they have time or the ability to read. Let's say that you're able to listen 10 units a day, whatever the unit is. Reading, maybe you can only do in like three of those units. You know what I'm saying? Of course. And there's a few places where you can read more than listen. You know, you could, you know, like if you're pretending you're paying attention in church or something like that, you could be reading something else, but not listening to something else. And, you know, at work, you could maybe read something where you shouldn't have something on your head. But in general, people can listen more. Secondly, as some people are not maybe in our business so much, you know, there's people that are not going to read stuff that's not in the format of what you're talking about, or, you know, the pharmacist letter things like that. It's just too much. But the third thing I like is that it's the first time where people can go deeper and stuff. I was just talking last podcast that, you know, the news will come and do a story and it'll be a, they'll be there for 30 minutes and you're lucky to get 15 seconds on there. And typically it's going to be the 15 seconds that's in the direction that they want it to go. Where the podcast, this long form, it's really the first time where you can take apart stuff and really, you know, really get into both sides of it. What do you like to listen to for news? Mm, I just make up my own news in my head. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Up First by NPR. Oh, I don't like that. Those those NPR people put me to sleep. Have you listened to Up First? I don't know, but it just they're always so like <laughs> calm and they put me to sleep. Is Up First are they different? Yeah, I think they have some energy. I would need a show where they where they do a line of cocaine before they get on if it's NPR. <laughs> It's not your it's not your father's NPR. Are you not sure? at all. Hundred oh percent. I love it. And they bring in correspondents from different parts of the country. They're NPR correspondents, literally, from different parts of the country, different backgrounds, different voices. I love what they do. It's a podcast. It's a podcast. And what and it comes out early in the morning or something or what? It does. Yes. I usually listen to it right after my son gets on the bus about eight thirty in the morning. And how long is it? I think they try to make it less than seventeen minutes. Sometimes it's twelve, sometimes it's seventeen. I get my news from Mail Online. Do you know that? No. I'm unfamiliar with that. Mail online is like um it's from Britain and it's uh but it's usually pretty quick information, but it's kind of a mixture of like um, the old USA Today paper mixed in with like People Magazine or Us Us Magazine. You know, it's a little bit of, it's got some stories in there that kind of grab your attention. You know, mm -hmm. my wife's like, where do you, where do you come up with this stuff? I'm like, mail online. Everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> NPR. Yeah. I don't know about that. So what have you seen from your podcast then? I was joking about that. No like and trust, but. I mean, let's face it, a lot of things people are trying to get out of people they hire or things they buy is just not to get screwed. You know, everybody wants to screw you in this world. And if you can at least know somebody, they don't need to be like blown away by someone's service. They just need to know, like, and trust you. Well, they need to know my voice. It, it is as advertised. This is what it's going to sound like on your audio too, by the way, <laughs> you know. Does your voice always sound like your voice though? 
I'll tell you what, there are some things I can do with my my tools. Let's just say I have a, a DAW, a digital audio workstation. Sure. What do you use? I use Studio One Artist. What do you use? I just use Audacity, which is a free program. I started off with Audacity. I'm totally with you on that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a Wikipedia where, what do they call that? Group think kind of or group whatever. Crowdsource. It's built for free by you know, hundreds of people. That What would be Firefox is like that. Wikipedia would be an example. You know, it's written by the people. You know, so Audacity is the same way, written, you know, made by the people. I have to be an IBM guy because of the programs at work and so on. But I'll use like, I guess, Logic X or something like that. So why'd you go to your other one versus Audacity? There's a number of programs out there. When I first started working with Sean Pratt for the nonfiction audiobook narration training, he had suggested that I get a program that allowed something called punch and roll. Do you know what that is? I know what punch is. Typically, that's punching in right away for one word that got missed. I found out when audiobook narrators narrate an entire book, they often make mistakes, which, you know, that's a given. How do they fix it, though? That's the question. So I learned a little bit about how you listen to the, you know, five or 10 seconds prior to that, maybe even speak along with it to make sure that your pacing is the same. And, you know, if your energy is a little different at that time of the day when you originally did it. Yeah, because this could be a month later when the proofer gets it back to you. I've had to become quite the audio engineer. Yeah, you really do. And I, I think the better that you get at that, the more relaxed you can be. Not that you want to fix everything in the edit. I'm sure it's a lot of times it's better to do it live and so on. But the more confidence you have in it, like I know exactly what I can do on Audacity. I know what I can fix and what I can't fix. I know going into it that I can't fix someone who's got a bad echo, you know, but I know I can fix if there's a air conditioner in the background, things like that. But it's nice to know that going in so you're not wasting time later on. A lot of people ask me what I use. And we talked about how I used to use Audacity and then I switched to Studio One Artist. What's really important to know is that there's communities out there that can help. And that is huge. When I first started using Studio One Artist, there was a huge community out there and there were people who taught classes about it. Anybody that's listening to this and wants to start a podcast or go into voiceover, whatever DAW you pick, whether it's Audacity Studio One or whatever, make sure there's a community that can support you or courses you can take, because that's huge. Knowing who and how to get help, how to get help, who to get help from, it's huge. My theory with the podcasting, I know, has been just do it, you know, the old Nike slogan. And I can afford to do that because, well, number one in podcasting, a lot of people don't go back to your early stuff. You know, they're they're going to your your last half of your shows and so on. And that's when the numbers start to drop off a little bit more. So I came out my first podcast is like, damn, if I don't just do this, I could overthink this thing forever. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I just started with a, you know, talking into my phone, basically recording a phone call and, and putting it on. And, um, and then once you get a little traction, you say, well, okay, I did that part, you know, but I suppose yours would be a little bit trickier because you're not able to come out with, you know, you probably want your sound and your performance to hold water from the start. Would that be fair or not? Yes and no. I'm one of those one and done people. I really don't have time to keep doing it over and over What you hear, I usually just record it. And then if I listen to the playback and it sounds unlike what I want it to sound like, I will do something or part of it again. But really, a lot of times my husband will say, okay, I'll give you 20 minutes because, you know, I I have other responsibilities and I'll just go into the closet and I'll record it. Sometimes they're three and a half minutes. Sometimes it's five minutes. Sometimes it's eight. Sometimes it's 17. I really literally do not have time to keep doing it over and over and over again. And when I tell people that talk to me about building their own podcasts, I'll tell them just start. And just start. here's the thing. You don't have to publish everything that you record. You can do practice podcasts and just hide them from everybody. And maybe someday you'll look back at it and say, oh, I guess that wasn't that bad. Let's put it out as a bonus episode. You can do that. Uh, but your question is, does everything have to be pristine and perfect and polished and super produced. Nope, not for me. (laughs) 
No, I mean, I make an outline. I often write my show notes first, and then I I wouldn't say I read them word for word, but it's pretty much what I was going to say anyway. So I've got some clues in case I forget what I was going to say. And then right. I just say it, and then I'm done. And then I have to edit it, and I take out any gasping breaths or you know uh, anybody slamming a door, and it gets put out there. I take out any time that I went down with myself like a boring path, you know, and people don't realize that I record 10 hours of this and get it down just to one because I take out so much of my stuff. Really? No. <laughs> I was going to say, we're, we're only I, scheduled for like an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> this is only going to be a minute show, Kim, when, <laughs> when I get done with it. To your point of that, when I first did my show, I realized quickly that I wanted it to be an interview podcast, but I had put out probably, I don't know, so five nice. or six like Mm -hmm. three minute things, you know? And yeah, once I got a few episodes in, I said, I don't want those on there anymore. I just took them off, you know, just took them off the feed. What difference would I hear from three years ago if I had hired you to do something? I imagine a lot of your training is gaining confidence in yourself. And that's probably a big one right there, gaining confidence in yourself, knowing that you've done the work. But what difference? <laughs> I'm going to play devil's advocate. What difference would I really hear from three years ago if I said, Kim, I'm going to have you do this for me? Boy, my audio engineering has come so far. I know how to do so much more. And, yes. and that's essential, right? <laughs> because as you're starting out, I mean, there's no way you're going to hire someone to do your audio. You just have to do it. Well, I might disagree with that. I was recently interviewing April Jones. She's a pharmacist and also an author, and she narrated her own audiobook. She went right mm. to a pro studio, and she had the engineers record her. That was so smart. And I'm not trying to take business away, potential business away from myself, but if anybody wants to cut the learning curve completely and just have a pro studio with pro equipment and you don't have to buy any of it, you can just rent it. But how long can you do that? I mean, that's expensive. Your goal, though, is to get into the heart and soul of this. And that, I think, includes the technical yes. part. If you asked her what her skills are, it's going to be, you know, pharmacist, mm -hmm. this and that, and author and all that. And even able to convey that, maybe even being a speaker or something, but it's probably not a voice talent. She probably would not describe herself as that, right? Right, right. Between three years ago and now, audio engineering has come a huge long way. I'm able to remove something called mouth noises, which I didn't even realize I had. And when I had audacity, I didn't know how to do that. Uh, my ears now hear better. I My ears are so much better trained. And I just love to learn all this stuff. I continue to learn. And the performance, I continue to improve my performance with the goal being additional demos. I'm training with a new medical narration coach. I plan to train with her either every month or every other month. And I'm going to hopefully pretty soon here be starting with an e-learning instructor just so I can get an e-learning demo. Just because I've used the work doesn't mean I can put it on my website. There are non-disclosure agreements and clients don't want their internal stuff put on my website as demos. <laughs> right, right. So I'm guessing that three years ago, the stuff I would have heard from you would have been good. But you would have noticed a difference. Would we all have noticed a difference? You would totally have noticed a difference. Really? I have come across stuff that I, yes, that I recorded almost three years ago. I didn't even know how to use a USB mic about three years ago. I had to pay somebody to teach me how to do that. You mean to plug it in? How, no, I know how to plug it in, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> how do you mean use one? Here's the thing. Oh, I'll tell you. I've talked to many a person who has a mic and they're using it. And then what ends up happening is I'll say, you know what? Something's not quite right. Do you mind if we take a moment? I need you to go to the preferences for Zoom, for example. Yeah, right. And I want you to look at what your computer has selected as your microphone. Yeah. And they'll say, it says internal microphone. And I'll, yeah. you know what I'm saying now, Mike? Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I did that by accident. I had a great interview set up with Scott Kenor from American Pharmacists mm -hmm. Association. This is like six shows ago. And we were having problems connecting. And so I said, mm. Scott, let's hang up both sides. We'll both restart our computer and get back in. And it wasn't until I mixed this thing down that I realized that when I came back into the show, 
I was on my internal. I was on my whatever the hell, Logitech, you know, camera. I was on that mic. Thankfully, Scott had enough material that I just got to enjoy the show and and put some comments in. But it wasn't a talk heavy show for me. But the, I, I even considered recording the whole damn thing over just my own questions again on my external mic than to what I had down. I'm assuming my ATR 2100 is on. <laughs> <laughs> you sound great. Said, said the girl who, you know, just said that people don't know how to check their preferences. But yes, that is something that I did not know how to do three years ago. That that was trouble. And then delivery, I didn't know about giving yourself a running start. You start talking before you use the recorded stuff. So the first thing that's out of your mouth is not your lips parting. There's mm, so many little things. Interesting. Is your stuff taking out all the breaths? All the in-breaths? Uh, sometimes the on my podcast, if it is loud enough that I personally find it distracting, I will either reduce it by about 10 decibels or I will remove it completely. Yeah. I'm a bit of a heavy breather. I have asthma. Yeah. My standards are lower. I at least take out any <laughs> belches. <laughs> <laughs> One of my passions, like a lot of people have, like they like to golf or go to movies and stuff. I can't concentrate through all that. And I suck at golf and I can't concentrate through movies very well. <laughs> but one thing I've always enjoyed is computer problems. And I don't mean like coding problems. I don't know how to do that crap. But I mean like just problems like getting a new microphone and saying, wait, this – where do I plug? You know, I've always liked that stuff. <laughs> and it takes my it takes my mind away. And I think the explanation for that is – the reason I never give up on that stuff and I'll fight to the death to figure something out is because I've been trained that way in the pharmacy for 30 years. You know, if a computer goes down or something at the pharmacy, you don't have a choice. I mean, you don't go home until it's fixed. So in the morning you come back and you can continue business. And that'd be the, you know, a printer or a modem or things like that, not a microphone. But I've always enjoyed those and I've never given up. And I'm sure you, once you get money involved with all this, you don't have the choice just to say, I, I can't figure this out. I mean, you've got to figure it out. Of course. Yes. There's so many online communities that I'm part of and I ask for help. I'm trying to think of some of the things. Okay. When I first started podcasting, I used Skype and Ecamm Skype call recorder. And because I have those things on a Mac, there was something that was not right with compatibility. Yes. And you may have heard of this. My guest would sound great, and I would sound very quiet in comparison. And I I don't want to say anything negative about Mac products because I use them. I love them. But for whatever reason, Skype and Ecamm didn't work so well recording interviews. And then I'd have to bring my guest's volume down and mine way up so that we were the same. So you're not riding the volume knob. Yeah, right. Listening to one of my podcasts. But then I just gave up after a while. I, I thought, oh, boy, I only paid 40 bucks for this. It's time to let it go. I think it was right about the time that I interviewed Ali Zhu. She was in Australia. I was, of course, in Ohio here in the U.S., and as I'm listening to this playback, I'm like, oh, this is the last time, darn it. You know, mm -hmm. I just hate having to, you know, yeah. do all this engineering stuff. I know how to do it. But right. then I switched to Squadcast and Squadcast has been fantastic. I was with Squadcast for my first probably, probably the first 60% of my shows. And I was having problems that when they switched over to doing the Echo Echo cancellation. Echo cancellation. I think mine was always stuck on because it was ducking all the time. So if you hear the mm. guest talk, mine would duck out. And I wrote them numerous times. They were very helpful. They tried to solve it. But I think there was something stuck. So I switched over to another one called uh, remotely.fm. Does the same same stuff, basically. But that problem hasn't happened. One of my biggest errors in the podcast was, thankfully, it was my brother <laughs> and he owes me for all the torture he gave me when I was a kid, you know. <laughs> Somehow we cut out after about 20 minutes and we came back on. We were talking for about 30 minutes and he said, he said, hey, Mikey, is this uh – is this thing supposed to be counting? <laughs> and so when I came back in, I forgot to, I forgot to press record, but – Oh, that, was, that was boring stuff he was talking about anyway. Yeah. Who cares yeah. what your brother says, Who cares right? what your brother says? <laughs> so, Kim, we had the option of doing this earlier. Tell me again why we were delaying this a little bit. 
I had a personal goal of finishing my audiobook narration program prior to being on your podcast. That was a personal goal, and I achieved that on September the 2nd. I worked one-on-one with an instructor. I improved my performance. I learned about the business of audiobooks, how to get on rosters. I'm on the roster for Audible, for example. I interviewed at least one person on the show, and they said when their book hit audio, it really took off. He was really surprised how well it did compared to print. Was that Tony Guerra by any chance? Yeah, Tony, yeah. Yes, that was a really smart move. He broadened his audience by having an audiobook version. Yeah, and that's the stuff we were talking about, about going from, you know, whatever, 10 points. You know, you just get more points of contact with that. Yeah, Tony said he did really well once he got to audio. All right, so Kim, you finished up your class. I know that you've had the different trainings. Does each of these then open up a little bit something more or at least give you the confidence of it? Absolutely, yes. Once I get training in a certain genre, I feel like I'm more prepared to work in that genre, whether it's audiobooks or explainer videos, medical narration, e-learning. There's so much out there. That's great, Kim. I wish you all the best on this stuff. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on your podcast. Pleasure having you on. I'm going to be following you. It's going to be strange because all of a sudden I'm going to be sitting there and I'm going to like hear your voice come over like the the pharmacy. (laughs) That'd be cool. Unless you have your Darth Vader. (laughs) I'll teach you how to do that. So, all right, Kim. Pleasure meeting you. All right. Bye, Mike. Thanks. 